authority. I didn't bring it. I didn't know you were all coming.
Mrs. Bailey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Here. Mr. Vashon? Here. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Um, there are, and there is an addition of agenda item 5.7, motion to approve FY18 budget amendments. Okay. All right, that takes us to 5.0, new business. 5.1, meeting minutes of April 6, 2017, workshop meeting. Approval as printed. Second. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Five plus one. Seven plus one. I think. Um, Five point two meeting minutes of April sixth business meeting. Move approval as printed. Second. Any comments or questions or changes on the phone? Okay. All in favor? That is Seven plus one. Five point three. Project grades donation to school nutrition program. Um, so I would like to um, ask the school board to accept this generous donation of two thousand five hundred dollars made to the school nutrition program from Project Grace. This donation will be used to cover expenses for breakfast, um, breakfast, lunches, milks, and snacks for students whose families need extra help. Stephanie Cox of Project Grace is here to talk more about their organization and their donation. Uh, thank you very much and good evening uh, school board, school administrators, principals, and students on the council here too. Um, Project Grace is very uh, happy and pleased to have such a, a long-standing partnership with the school system. I want to take a very, uh, you have a long agenda, you've been working very hard on budgets and other things. I'll keep my comments fairly brief for you tonight. Um, but I wanted to take a moment and recognize uh, your head of nutrition, uh, Peter Esposito, and his uh, very able staff, including Brenda Franklin, who have really been helping us understand how we can work together with um, resolving some hunger issues among the student population, but also among their families. This grant, um, any extra that does not is not needed for milk, snacks, or lunches can be applied to uh, food for the backpack program, which is uh, the food that goes home with families during the extended holidays. We also make um, inter uh, smaller grants throughout the year to the school nurses program so that they can purchase fresh fruit and other uh, fresh items for that. Peter Esposito has been really helpful in um, working with Project Grace to um, to identify uh, families who might need a little extra support. Uh, the grant that you're receiving today largely covers uh, lunches and snacks for families who may not, who do not necessarily qualify for the free and reduced program, but don't have uh, access to good food at home. Their kids come to school hungry. Um, uh, with Brenda's help, some of that money has also been providing second helpings for students who um, just don't get enough food at home or, um, uh, or in otherwise sort of shaky food situations. So we're very pleased. We're sorry we have the problem, but we're glad to be working together on resolving it. The other uh, thing I'd like to to call your attention to was the Food for Thought and Action Forum, which was convened by Project Grace, the Scarborough Food Pantry, and the School Nutrition Department uh, this spring. And in, during that conversation, several issues came to light, and we're looking forward to working with um, members of the community on resolving questions like, how can we provide more fresh food to families in need? How can we um, reach out to students who aren't coming forward and asking for help when they're when they're little, they tend to say, I'm hungry. When kids are older, they tend to keep that to themselves. That's an issue we would like to, to work on in the future. I'd also like to, to thank the, the uh, staff in the social work and nursing departments 
some of this grant pays for snacks for kids uh, who, who might need them uh, when they go to the nurse's department. Uh, th those uh, staff and teachers have keen eyes. They notice when a kid's shoes are pinching or they're coming to school with clothing that's not appropriate for the weather or for um, their, their size or grade or what have you. And they really help us get Get, uh, get help to families um, who might not know to, to ask for it through Project Grace directly. And, um, and they do it in a very caring, private, and sensitive way, and we appreciate them for that. And I'd also like to recognize um, uh, your chair, Kelly Murphy, for facilitating that workshop uh, very ably and comfortably, clearly a lot of experience here, but also with a great deal of warmth that let people feel comfortable to bring their concerns forward. Um, and finally, I'd like to recognize Jackie Perry and the, her work with um, the Builders Club in the middle school and, uh, and many others uh, here who helped us host a Junior Trivia Bee, which is a lot of fun. It raised about $500 in donations, which is applied towards uh, our nutrition and school outreach. So those kids, they did a great job. They had a lot of fun. The Builders Club really put their hearts into it to make it a lot of fun. And uh, the staff and teachers at both Wentworth and the middle school really did a stellar job. And uh, we wanted to thank them for that. So um, if you have any questions about Project Grace, we're Neighbors Helping Neighbors. We are celebrating our 15th year this year. And we invite the entire town, all of our closest friends and neighbors here, um, to come and celebrate with us in Memorial Park on Thursday. June 15th, the concert with the main pops starts at 6.30, and beforehand we have uh, food trucks and fun and other music and, and little surprises for everyone. So we hope you'll, you'll come on out and, and uh, celebrate what a caring, thoughtful, compassionate, and loving community we have. And, uh, and I appreciate your time this evening very much. Thanks. Thank you, Project Grace, for always being a partner to the school for things that we can't always cover or um, are outside of our budget, so Project Grace has been helping since nearly the inception of Project Grace. We've had a partnership, um, the school department and Project Grace. So um, there's a lot of crossover all the time between volunteers and, and um, people doing good work. So thank you for the work that you do and for making a donation that makes us be able to help others as well. Do so I have a motion? Uh, move to accept the donation with great thanks to Project Grace for helping us and being a partner with us and continuing to do that. Second? Any more questions or comments? Are we all set to vote? Okay. All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you very much. And now that takes us to 5.4, food services donation from Saco and Bitterford City. Thanks. Um, so, a fun night tonight to be accepting all these donations. Um, we have a couple of them. So, this one is from, um, it's another donation to the school nutrition program in the amount of $1,000 from the SACO uh, and Bitterford Savings Bank. Great. Thank you so much, the SACO and Bitterford Savings. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. And again, these are donations that help us help kids that need a little extra that don't qualify for free and reduced or their family might be going through a hard time. So this money is definitely most appreciated and put to good use. All in favor? Seven plus two, thank you. 5.5, .5, a middle school donation from Hannaford Health Schools Program. Um, please accept this donation for the middle school from Hannaford Supermarkets and their program called Hannaford Health Schools in the amount of $948. This money will be used in the school's general fund. And then we can take the high school at some time if you want to. Sure. Um, from, the same, um, from the same organization, this is the final donation for tonight. Hannaford Supermarket is donating $1,000 to Scarborough High School. And like the middle school, the high school will apply this donation towards the school's general fund for future use. Great. Thank you so much. Do you have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. And thank you to all the people who have dropped those slips into the mm -hmm. containers at, at Hannaford. Okay. So 5.7. Motion to approve the FY18 budget amendment. So I, um, Kate has 
handed out some colorful flyers again for you. Um, and we just have the next step in our 2018 budget is for the school board to approve the amendments that were passed last night with the town council. Um, well, the board has already voted on the first round, which is the first page of your handout. Um, some adjustments have occurred since our second reading, and those are located on the back. They shouldn't be trying to do the same thing we've been talking about for over a couple weeks now. Um, as you know, the School Board Finance Committee has worked with the school and town leaders to develop these further adjustments, so I have three action items for you. First item is move approval to amend the FY18 school operating budget expenditures approved at the school board's second reading on April 27, 2017, as follows. Reduce general fund operating expenditures by $152,000. Amend general fund expenditures budget will now total $47,411,168. No further change was made to the adult education and school nutrition expenditure budget. <laughs> Move approval. Second. You need a second. second. Yeah. Okay. Any questions or comments about this? Okay. All in favor? That means plus two. Thank you. My second item is move approval to amend the FY18 school operating budget revenues approved at the school board's second reading on April 27, 2017, as follows. Increase general fund operating non-tax revenues by $3,000. That's um, an adjustment to the MLTI grant projection. Um, and then amended total education, general fund, adult ed, and school nutrition non-tax revenues will now total $6,338,475. Second. Second. Okay, any questions or comments about this one? Okay, all in favor? Seven plus two, thank you. My last one. Move approval to amend FY18 school CIT budget approved at the school board second reading on April 27, 2017 as follows. <coughs> the technology CIT expenditures by 22,000 we're deferring a van purchase and disaster recovery plan. Um, amended CIP expenditures budget will total. Technology is 309200 Facilities and maintenance is $769,000. Transportation is $318,000 for a total of $1,396,000. $1,396,200. Second. Second. Any questions or comments about this one? Um, I should note that a portion of the school CIP budget was um, funded through tax revenue is now 53000 which was um, determined by the town finance office. Okay. A reduction of a hundred. Oh, uh, reduction of $174,000 from 227000 passed at town council's first reading. Mm -hmm. Good. Second. Okay. All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. Question. What was the first number, Jody, that we had for the school budget? In other words, I would like to know where we started and how much it is. I know it says one million thirty-six thousand five ninety-three here, but my recollection is it has really been reduced from the initial budget more than that. That's the Pardon me? That's the cumulative reduction. Mm -hmm. from the beginning. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. Okay. Act takes us to 6.0, an appointment. 6.1, K2 principal and improvement strategy. Um, yes, I would like to uh, introduce you to our finalist for the Pleasant Hill Principal and K2 Improvement Strategist. It's someone that we all know very well, um, Principal Barbara Hathorn, if you could come up to the podium. Barbara has been nominated to fill this position that is being created by a retirement. Um, and since Ann Cass uh, just informed me she won't be here on June 1st, we can congratulate Ann Cass on her retirement. Um, 
Barbara began her career here in Scarborough Schools in 1996 as a sixth grade language arts teacher and social studies teacher. Before long, she moved into the role of assistant principal and has been the principal of Scarborough Middle School since 2009. There was only uh, one other principal of that middle, of the existing middle school, if anyone knows who that person is. Barbara has proven herself to be a strong leader and an advocate for both her staff and her students. She's been an instrumental member of several school committees, including the PEPG committee, um, which is our evaluation and professional growth committee, the PBE committee, I'm going to see how many acronyms we can get in here, which is the Proficiency-Based Education Committee that is working very um, hard these days to get us ready for our transition, the Habits of Work Committee, which is a subgroup of the PBE committee, and many others. She's also developed and implemented many creative and innovative programs for her staff and schedules um, that have benefited the students and allowed the, the students really to thrive and grow in our middle school. Um, so tonight I'm very pleased to nominate Barbara for this position as it is not only creates an excellent opportunity for our primary schools, um, both the students and staff, but it's also a really great opportunity for her as a school leader. Um, and it does um, open up the middle school for new leadership as well. So looking at this from an organizational perspective, it really feels like a, a triple win all around um, for the opportunities that it's creating. So the recommendation is to appoint Barbara Hathorne as the Pleasant Hill Principal and K-2 Improvement Strategist. Can you approve? So moved. <laughs> Second. I couldn't be happier. This is so great. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome to your new life <laughs> in the small. In the small. Um, this is our commentary. Oh, all right. We're going to have our comments. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, I was just thinking last night about your, um, I just keep calling it budget wizardry, at the middle school this year and still able to um, maintain and shift things around to still have the essential programs, but then the bridge program was incredible and just amazing work. So I can't imagine now it's unleashed at K2 <laughs> what, what <laughs> possibilities are in store for us. So I'm very excited. Anybody else? Jackie. Uh, I transitioned from teaching high school to teaching elementary school uh, when I was in Portland. And after three months, I had the opportunity to go back to the high school because I was at the elementary school on an involuntary transfer. And when I was offered the opportunity to go back to the high school, I said, not on your life. I <laughs> had just too much fun getting to know these young people and helping to develop them to move on. So I'm so excited. It is a rejuvenating experience. And from my perspective, uh, I think it's going to keep Barbara here for a few more years. <laughs> I have to echo that too as well, Barb, because I spent 19 years at the middle school and then went to K-5 and the K-2. And it's just, it is reinvigorating. It's very exciting to do that. Not to say there aren't challenges at the lower grade levels, <laughs> you know. Um, in some ways, it is e easier at the high school. But um, just so, so much fun. So much fun. You're going to love this part. And hugs. Mary? Oh, well, I'm, I'm thrilled for you. I, I am a little sad, though, because you had all three of my children at the middle school, and mm -hmm. my youngest is still going to be there. But... Um, <laughs> But I'm thrilled for the change, and, you, and you've been a, just a wonderful principal. You know, I've been so happy to have my children at the school with you, and uh, and I know, but I know that the K to two will K two will benefit as well. So, Thanks. congratulations. Mm -hmm. It's just like a broken record. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're very excited for you. When when I saw this come through, it was it was very exciting, and we're happy for you. Thank you. This picture of you with two little cuties tells yeah. you that your, your stuck zipper skills and your <laughs> nose wiping skills. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll be in good hands, I'm sure. Exciting, excited to see everything that you do in the future. So congratulations. <laughs> Barb, did you want to say any words? 
Well, first of all, I have loved my time at the middle school. It's been wonderful, but I started my career with the littles. So it is so exciting to get back with the little kiddos. Um, I started with kindergarten, first, second grade. So this is just like coming home. And I'm very excited to be working with the leadership at uh, the K-2s. I think we will be a fabulous threesome, <laughs> fierce threesome, right? Hey, Sam. <laughs> we are, we're going to do some great things. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It, is, it will be reinvigorating. I love Scarborough. I w I'm so happy to continue my work here. So thank you. Seven plus two. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, that takes us to our workshop, 7.0. 7.1 is the NEAF update. Yes, so <coughs> last summer when I first came on board, one of the requests of the school board was to have some consistent updates of the NEAF self-study process. And so we've had two so far this year where David has brought you along in the process. Um, and tonight he has prepared a one-pager for you um, that will continue to um, that where he'll continue to update us and let us know what the work is for the rest of this year. Um, but oh, um, you know, um, I like to start always by reminding us of our mission. So David, when you get there, if you could just click for us, that would be great. Um, you know, I think it's really important to always ground ourselves in the reason why we're here and why our public schools exist. And so I share with you our mission that the fundamental purpose of our schools is ensuring high levels of learning for each and every student. Therefore, we will do whatever it takes to bring all students to their full potential. And so David's going to give us our NEASC update, and then we're in for a real treat tonight because you're going to be able to hear from all of our principals at each phase level as they talk about the ways that they are supporting our students um, throughout their growth and development. So, David? Thank you. Good evening. And I'd like to congratulate Barbara as well for her new position and wish you well. Um, in the last two NEASC updates, you've had the privilege of hearing from our two co-chairs for the steering committee. And I think they've done a wonderful job of mapping out for you the, the process we go through. So I'm not going to go through all of those steps because you've heard them twice before, but it's been summarized for you on the paper that's been provided. So you'll have an opportunity to look at that. But the standard approval process was completed as of this afternoon. So we have seven standards. Those seven standards that have been shared with you in the past have been work created uh, by committees. Committees have collected evidence and data. They've provided uh, strengths and, uh, and needs. They've had executive summaries shared with the entire staff. The staff provides feedback. That feedback is considered by those committees, and then they put forth uh, an executive summary report that's voted on by the staff. Uh, the last two were voted on today and they were both unanimous. So the seven standards are complete. Um, and I heard at one of the previous board mem meetings uh, discussion that the NEAS SEF study will be done this year. That's uh, not the case. There is still a lot of work to be done, but the primary first and probably most important piece of this is the standards piece has been completed. So what happens next? Well. As a staff, it's our responsibility for each standard to prioritize strengths and needs. So we had five strengths and five needs for each standard. Then that's given to the entire staff, and the staff takes that information and through the, the wonderful technology of Google Forms, sends their priority list to the steering committee. And then as a school, we create what we believe as a school are the top five strengths and the top five needs moving forward with this process. That is in its final stages. We're compiling that information as we speak. And then once we've identified that critical list of strengths and needs, that again will go back to the entire staff to review. We'll receive feedback, adjust as necessary, and then the June 1st vote. So that's the next stage to this process. Um, and then the last piece of this, which I think um, a lot of you I'm sure are aware of, but there is a lot of work that has to be done after these reports have been completed. All the final reports have to be edited. We want to have one voice. For any of you who have been involved with this before, you realize 
We have so many different hands. It's, it's very challenging to ensure that there's one voice for the reports, but we take care of that. All the evidence is uploaded into the NEASC portal. We start collecting evidence on uh, examples of student work in categories such as homework, group activities, essays, quizzes, tests, labs, reflections, portfolios, projects, exhibitions, presentations, and others. So right now we're collecting evidence of student work at all types of levels to be able to share with that visiting committee next year as an example of the assessments that we use at the high school. We'll complete our school and community summary. And then part of what's happening is we've tried to include our students as much in this process as possible. So for the school, community, school and community summary, we have had Eric Huntington's video productions class. They have been videotaping throughout the course of the year. They're videotaping the Scarborough community, all that happens within the schools, all that happens within our high school. They're videotaping school community members, teachers, uh, school leaders, students. So they're in the process of finalizing that, and that's going to be an important ingredient in that initial day when we present to the, to the visiting committee for the first time. It's going to be student work, and they're the ones that are going to be creating that, that video presentation. So that's continuing to be worked on. And then there are a lot of logistics that have to be planned for for next year. And part of that is, is a part of the NEASC blueprint they give us. Other parts of that are tied to when we meet with the visiting chair, and that chair lays out to us specific details that we have to follow to make sure that the, the committee and its needs are, um, are fully explained to us and we've, we're well prepared. That visit happens typically the end of August. So we're working on the logistics. We're going to try to finish up um, a lot of the things that have to be replaced in the portal before the end of the school year. We're going to work on the logistics uh, during the summer. So hopefully when we start the school year, we have most of our plan in place um, with very little to do in terms of things like we already have the hotel set, we'll have all the different needs for the visiting committee all tied up and ready to go. Um, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough how demanding this process has been on our staff, how proud I am and our leadership team is of the work that's been done. There's been tremendous leadership. This has been staff-led, staff-driven, staff-completed. Our two steering co-chairs, David O'Connor and uh, Lauren Bornstein, are fantastic. They're well-respected. They've guided the staff through this whole process. Our seven standards chairs have worked tirelessly, uh, many hours outside the hours allotted to them within the schedule to complete this process. And as I promised you at the very beginning, this is not just about an accreditation process. This has provided for us a very in-depth look at Scarborough High School and what we do well and what we need to work on. And we're going to begin that work immediately. We're not waiting, waiting for the November 5th through 8th committee visit to identify those things that we already know are going to be things we have to work on. Uh, the last thing I'd like to um, offer to you is being a part of these visitation committees before, I know how important that initial, that first day experience is. And we're inviting all of you and all of the school community to attend that first day. It's November 5th. It'll be an afternoon event at the high school. And it's where we really give them the first glimpse of our school, our school community, and the support that's out there. You'll also be invited to be a part of different meetings where the site Committee members will be questioning you about your role and those things that you can share with them regarding our school and our school community. So on numerous occasions, you're going to hear me welcome and invite community members and yourself to come to that November 5th first opening day presentation. Um, we have such a wonderful community that are very supportive, and I think it would be great to have many of those community members there to show that support for that first day. Um, and that's where we are at this point. I'll take any questions you may have. So, so NEAS has specific criteria for the seven standards that we're being assessed on. Mm -hmm. And so assessment, instruction, curriculum, <coughs> and those. So there are indicators that we have to go out and our staff have to 
try to collect evidence on where we are as a school within those specific indicators for each standard. Okay. And it's standard set by NIAS, but it's best practices. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what you said is, is true. We'll take that information and we use it to rate ourselves, for lack of a better word, on whether we believe that we meet the criteria of the standard or if we have some work we need to do or we just don't meet that standard yet. And from those results, that has guided us on the strengths and needs that we create for each standard and then the overall strengths and needs as a school. So then they arrive in November, this team of people is going to come in and swoop down for a week or four to four or five days and really analyze what you've got, the data that you've provided with them, and then take a look at out of which will come these recommendations. Yes, and that's a great that's a great point because evidence is in all kinds of forms. So, so evidence, first of all, there's um, the Endicott survey is, is a survey that many people in the school community took, parents took, students took, staff took, mm -hmm. and it asked specific questions geared toward the standards. So we have that as evidence as to what's the general census amongst the stakeholders. Second is the evidence that we collect as a school and we provide that they'll all have an opportunity to read and preview before they ever come and visit us. Then while they're here, uh, when I was on my two site visits, I spent an enormous amount of time. I collected evidence by talking to people, witnessing things in the classroom, speaking to students, talking to teachers, observing what happens in a class, talking to board members, school leaders. So evidence takes on many forms during that site visit. So they collect as much evidence in as many different ways as they can and then they evaluate that evidence and make recommendations as a committee. Are you thinking, I mean, how far into next year will those recommendations yield possible budget implications? Will we have something by January? No. Uh, will it not come until the end of next school year so that we can't really um, consider the budget items? Um, I wish I had my handbook with me. It really tells you if you have a fall NEAS visit, hmm. when that's going to be. I know that in the spring visit that I conducted last year, um, it wasn't until the end of the summer that the chair had finished the final report, oh. sent it out for approval, and then it eventually goes to the building principal, and then on, obviously, to the superintendent of the board. So, we would probably, knowing what our budget process is, we would probably be at best halfway through our budget process yeah. if we do receive something. But that's why I alluded to this earlier, and, and we're not waiting for their recommendations for the things that we already knew we needed to work on and things that we knew we were doing well and we want to continue to build on those. So um, some of the information that we already have can be used to guide the budget process lecture even before they have their evaluation. Right, so it's possible then that you may have some inclination of what you might be getting back in terms of say if you needed three teachers for a certain course or you're not offering enough biology or you're not offering, there aren't enough guidance counselors, you need another social worker, the nurse isn't going to, you know, whatever, it's going to, you might have some implications some indication. I mean, I'm just trying to think of if, if, if it's not until actually the 1920 school year in order for us to look at any budgetary items, that's kind of unfortunate because it might be easier to spread some things out if we had. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know school, school districts in the past, the NEAS report has helped uh, them push through um, building projects and other things because buildings haven't maybe met up for right. the standards to be yep. approved by the I know communities yeah. use that. For us, I would say it would be a combo platter of three things. One is internally we always have a pretty good sense of what our needs are. Yeah. Two, we've already gone through the process uh, through the NEAS and so we've already identified those strengths and needs mm -hmm. so we can draw upon those and share with you mm -hmm. what we're sharing with them which yeah. is why we believe there are needs. And then the third piece would be when they come back with their report, it would probably support or validate in the eyes of the school community mm -hmm. the things that we would have put forward to you prior to their report. Okay, thank you for that. And, sure. and uh, you know, 
I'm sure I speak for other members on the board too. You need to thank your staff on behalf of the school board for the enormous amount of work that I know they are putting in and have put in all year and will put in again next year as a result of all this work. So if, I would really like them to hear that it is greatly appreciated. Thank you. I'll make sure I share that. Thank you. My experience also is that one of the first things that is looked at by the visiting committee is, are we doing what we say we're doing? Have we, have we validated for them those things that, that we say that we're doing, that our coursework or whatever it happens to be, that there, there are no surprises in other words? And secondly, uh, the last time that we were accredited here and when we were accredited when I was a teacher, uh, we had a preliminary at the end of the visitation, uh, just an overview. So there's an indication of where they're going. For example, I think the last time uh, that they were here and did our high school, one of the things that they talked about was the lack of space in our library and the fact that we needed um, more books actually so but we knew that going in that's a great point uh, in, in site visits that I've been a part of and we already know this with our own self-study you often find that things that were identified by the school during the self-study, they already began to work on. So by the time the committee gets here, mm -hmm. it might look differently than it had, say, six to nine months earlier when they were collecting evidence. Some of the things that we have identified as needs, our school district already knew this is a need, and we're already working on it, i.e. PBE, mm -hmm. yeah. to steal Julie's thunder. So proficiency-based education yeah. is something that we know as a school district is we need to have a lot of work done in that area. And our self-study has reflected that as well. So what they end up seeing during their site visit might look a lot different than what the self-study reflected hmm. six or nine months earlier. And they're used to that. They know that that's just a part of change for schools. Hmm. Anybody else? Mary? I'm just curious as far as the, the block schedule. Is that something like the, the schedule that you had before versus the block schedule, is that something that's does that relate at all to NEASC or is that a decision? I just wondered if that, if NEASC sees the schedule, like how your schedule is set up, is that something that they look at? And it is. So is that block schedule a more, a schedule that is better for? Yes. Yeah. There, there are things in this existing schedule, both that we put in this year and <coughs> the next year, that support NEASC standards, such as the advisory program. If we didn't have an advisory program, you could probably count on that being a recommendation. And also, uh, the flexibility and capacity of your schedule. Does it allow students to take those things that they should be taking for graduation and also be able to expand their interests if our schedule limits offerings and their ability to do that? That would have probably been another recommendation. So, yeah, there's a few things that I think that are tied to NEAS standards that the schedule would definitely address if we hadn't made the change. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank else? you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. David, could you just click the next slide for me? Yes, Thank you. Um, so now we're going to transition. Thank you, David, for that, that update and that presentation. Um, we're now going to transition to talking about some of the preventions and supports we have in place for our students um, for both expected and unexpected behaviors at each of our phase levels. And this image is not any image that we have adopted, but um, when I think what I, about what I'm observing in Scarborough Public Schools in terms of how we support our children, it really does um, align to this, this visual here that outlines what does it mean to educate the whole child. And so um, in schools today, we aren't just focusing on content and making sure that students know facts and figures and dates and, um, you know, names of influential people in history, we're really looking at how do we ensure achievement, how do we build positive relationships, um, how do we support risk taking in a really healthy way, um, how do we promote innovation and creativity and those guiding principles in terms of clear and effective communication skills, but also helping students develop values for themselves and others. 
um, and learning how to communicate about complex emotions. And so I think that you are really going to be impressed in what you hear happening at each of our, our phase levels. And we're going to just kind of start with K2 and work our way up. So um, I will ask the principals and assistant principals as they're speaking if you can go to the podium so that we can hear you and you can man the slides since I'm <coughs> clicking them from here. Um, but I also wanted to just give you a little landscape of what's been happening here in Maine around bullying prevention. And so um, back in 2005, there, were, there was, um, or I'm sorry, back in 2011, Maine revised the education and school statute uh, regarding bullying and cyberbullying. And then there has been updates again in 2012 and most recently in August 2016. So um, in preparation for tonight, I was going through and reviewing our policies and see how they aligned. And I do think that um, there's, we have five or six policies related to um, the reporting and tracking process of, of unexpected behaviors. And so I do think that um, we need to put that near the top of the list to review again because it looks like 2013 maybe was the last time we went through all of those okay. supporting documents. Uh, and I just wanted to remind us of that when we get, as we get started. So Anne, tell us a little bit about what um, student support looks like at K2. All right, so at K2, um, first of all, we're all continuously learning how to get along with each other, whether we're five or 50. So um, I think that that's an important thing to remember, that it's a skill that we continually practice and learn and grow in. Um, so we really truly believe that there are no bad kids. There are, it, at K2 especially, but um, we're just really, we're there to teach. We're there to support. We're there to show them the right way to, to interact with each other and to teach them that. Um, it's so important to actually teach those skills. So we have quite a bit of um, opportunity with our full-time social workers who are um, part special ed, part regular ed. They do a lot of, since we don't have guidance at K2, they really serve that role in a lot of ways. So um, they do a lot of in-class lessons, whole class lessons with each group. They particularly focus on the kindergartners in the beginning of the year. Um, a couple of the books that they do use, I've put up on the slide here. So have you filled a bucket today in the juice box fully? So many of you have probably heard your kids coming home talking about filling a bucket. Have you filled my bucket? Oh, that filled my bucket. And it's all about, um, you know, the emotional deposits that you make by doing nice things for each other and how that makes you feel good, it helps make them feel good, it helps you get along. Um, the Juice Box Bully is a, a perfect story to read to a classroom. It's about a little boy who comes to school new and he is not very nice to the classmates who have taken a, an oath to treat, other, to treat everybody kindly and respectfully. Um, and instead of treating him the way he's treating them, they tell him, this is not the way we treat each other. We are going to treat you the way we want you to treat us. And he eventually comes around and, um, and decides that it's OK, even though he had been bullied in his old school. So that's why he acted that way, to protect himself. Um, so it's a really it's great opportunity to talk to kids about what happens in, in class, little things, big things, what happens on the playground, what happens on the bus. Um, you can always connect it to, to one of these books. Um, and you know, to many others that we use. Um, we all three have positive behavior incentives and supports. So uh, all three schools, it all looks a little bit different, obviously, but we all talk about the expected behaviors and the unexpected behaviors. We um, teach our children from the very first day what it means to walk down the hall expectedly, third tile from the right, you know, <laughs> one after the other. Don't touch everything on the wall because you're going to knock something down or rip something or hurt something that's not yours and that's not respectful. Um, we all have the same sort of rules of be safe, be respectful, and be uh, responsible. I think Blue Point also uses be kind, just a little more child friendly for that age, but same, same idea. And we explicitly teach the skills of what that means and what that looks like in school. We have video modeling. We look at camera angles of what kids are doing in the hallway and show the class, look, this is what your class looks like walking down from lunch today. Is that expected? Is that what we want to see in the hallway? Because that's, that's really not safe, or that's, that was unkind. Or, um, and so we really use the, um, many opportunities as we can to, to, um, to teach them what 
what does it look like to be safe, respectful, and responsible in a school, um, and all over. Uh, we also do restorative practices in community circles, again, at an age-appropriate level. So if there's something going on in the classroom that's particularly disruptive, we'll, um, the social worker or Mrs. Cass or somebody will run a community circle and talk about how that behavior is affecting the rest of the class and how it's taking away from learning time and how that's not okay and we're all here to learn, but we all need to be safe first. Uh, and we also do responsive classroom. And Kelso, I'm sure everybody knows that name, still around is a conflict resolution program. It's, it's a very small part of it, but, con but Kelso does offer nine ways to solve a conflict that are small problems, not big problems. And again, you have to teach the difference between what's a big problem and what's a small problem. Um, so if somebody's going to be hurt or is going to hurt somebody else, that is a big problem and you get an adult immediately. If somebody's cutting in line, if somebody's took the pencil that you wanted to use, that's a small problem, and I bet you can figure out a way to handle that between each other. Um, the other things we talk about, um, social thinking curriculum by Michelle Garcia Winters, and that's a very uh, exciting program that kids love at this age. Superflex is a superhero character who helps you have expected behavior, and then there are the unthinkables that come and land on your shoulder. So maybe it's uh, the Volcano Man, the Volcano Man with his hands on your shoulder, he can make you have a big reaction to a very small problem. And that looks different for every child, but that it externalizes the behavior and makes it not quite so um, personal for a child at this age level. And then they can say, like, how can you get Volcano Man off your shoulder? How can you control Volcano Man so he doesn't take you over and make you have a big reaction to a small problem? And that makes it safe for the kids to talk about those feelings and it helps them identify what does that feel like in my body? What does it look like it, in, in my behavior? Um, and how can I control it? So we talk about that in small groups with um, kids with special needs as well as whole classes. Um, it's really all over the whole school. And there's a whole slew of characters that might land on your shoulder. Um, and and superhero. Um, Principal Lovejoy, didn't I see that this morning? <laughs> <laughs> Not one of the unthinkables. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good, a good, yeah, a good thing. <laughs> um, the Buddy Bench picture has uh, been an awesome place, and it, we, it arrived in time for the beginning of school. So the Buddy Bench is a concept of uh, when you're at recess, and we at, at my school we have uh, half of school out at once, so it's two kindergartens, two first and two second grades out all together. They don't necessarily all know each other. If somebody's feeling left out, if somebody's feeling like they don't have anything to play or anybody to play with, they can go sit on the buddy bench. We made a huge deal out of the second graders being in charge of the buddy bench and being mindful and noticing that somebody was sitting on it so they could go encourage that person and introduce themselves. So the second graders were really put into this leadership role right from the beginning of school to help everybody out. Um, and be leaders in the school, and oh, they, they loved that. They loved having their kindergarten buddies to walk out to recess with and show them all the things that they could do and all the things they weren't supposed to do, like going up the slide. Um, and they just took a lot of pride and a lot of, um, and a lot of joy in being, in being a leader instead of an adult having to do it. A peer told them that, and that made a huge difference. Um, so again, the, it, again, just an example, at Eight Corners, our 3D students, so every week teachers nominate one or two students in their classes who have exemplified be safe, be respectful, be responsible, above and beyond um, what's expected every day, and they get a 3B award, and their names are called out over the intercom. It's very important to hear your name called. It's very important to find your picture on the beehive wall there on the honeycomb. Um, and then when if you um, earn that, that honor, if you achieve that honor more than once, you get a sticker on your on your face on this chart. So um, kids really are very proud of that. Can't wait to show their parents at conference time or open house or whatever event might be going on where parents can come down and see that. Um, so those are a lot of the things that we do. Um, and we really, truly deeply believe that we are always having the opportunity to teach appropriate behavior and to teach how to treat each other and to teach how to get along. Um, so it's much more, uh, it's, it's a very supportive um, opportunity. It's not punitive. It is 
always about learning and always about an opportunity to make it right and always about an opportunity to do things better the next time or to have a different choice and to learn what those are. So that's, that's where we are at K2. Shout out to the PTA who purchased the money that you for us. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I just want to tell you that um, my kids are in high school and almost middle school, and we still talk about Kelso. <laughs> Making good choices, like Kelso, what would Kelso do right now? And on the news, what, like overreactions that are causing terrible behaviors, like Kelso's choices, man, like we talk about all the time. So <laughs> things live on. Yeah, just find just another game. game. There's all sorts <laughs> of ways you can do it. <laughs> so the stuff that is happening in K2, it lives on. It's getting carried on with those kids because it, I mean, obviously they're some of the most impressionable kids that we have and it's, they're following the rules later on and thinking <laughs> back to what they're learning at K2 and how to be responsible and kind people. So um, it's very, very important work. So thank you. Thank you for doing that and thank taking you that like emphasis. It provides a, a really good, strong foundation for when they all join each other up at Wentworth, they can all talk about the things the same way, and right. when they've never met each other, they know a lot of the same experiences and a lot of the same expectations, and it just leads right up into the respect guidelines that, that Wentworth has. So right. that's why. That was exactly how I was going to begin um, talking about Wentworth uh, banking and being appreciative for the strong foundation that the three K two schools. Cal, can you just introduce yourself? As oh, sure. Hello, the principal at Wentworth School. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so that foundation at Wentworth that at um, K two that really set students up for success, and they are ready for the next developmental level of support for positive behavior. Um, this year, some exciting work has been underway, and Mr. Thurlow's had some great leadership in this um, ad hoc committee, developing a statement of beliefs that's connected to our, um, our mission and our goals around positive support for behavior. So really what we have now is a very strong anchor to guide all of our decisions about how we support um, students and what our practices are for um, teaching expected behavior and how do, we, how do we respond when unexpected behavior does occur. So some of those belief statements is just a short um, paper, that, a short statement that all staff members have weighed in on. Um, a couple to share with you just to highlight that, for example, students are our collective responsibility, that everybody is in charge of all students, each and every one. Um, and that students can learn and apply self-awareness and self-regulation skills, understand ways um, how unexpected behavior impacts others, and discover ways to restore trust in relationships with adult, adult support. So that is the foundation and basis for the RESPECT guidelines that Ms. Lovejoy mentioned. And our RESPECT guidelines, you can see it's an acronym, and that's really the, the basis for everything that we do and the expectations for students. Um, not only those general behavior expectations around being responsible and encouraging, safe and polite, but also we have them um, for various settings throughout the school, um, really specific, because as Ms. Lovejoy said, it's the same as teaching math or reading. Students need to um, have experiences and be taught the expected behaviors in school and what this new setting means for them and how they can build upon what they've learned at the, at the primary school. So for example, they need to be taught how to safely navigate stairs at Wentworth while carrying a laptop. Um, those are all things that you spend time on at third through fifth grade. Um, or how to clap appropriately at an assembly. So what does that look like? I mean, that, that's something that you may not think about at an older level, but they need to learn how to do that and have it modeled and reinforced. Um, along with the common language and expectations and visuals and teaching materials, we hold monthly recognition ceremonies. Um, it's at lunch. It's really short, sweet, and to the point instead of using the intercom because we have um, many more students. I think that would take a lot of time, but each learning community 
has this monthly recognition and the teachers each recognize a student who has um, been a role model for the specific respect guideline that month. So for example, if September is responsible, a student in each class is chosen and then clearly explained how they have shown that they've been responsible that month. So not only is that some really great positive reinforcement for the students, but it's also a crystal clear example for everybody else in that lunchroom. Like, oh, that, that's what that means. Oh, I can do that. Um, so it's, that's been a really exciting, like, um, like at the K2, we have a display for them. You can see in the bottom of the slide and they get a certificate and um, it's a big honor and they feel very proud of that. Um, built into the schedule is also another way that we support this, some morning meeting and afternoon closing circle time. So this is how we start setting up for um, the work that the middle school is really deeply into also um, with those restorative circles and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that opportunity to just build relationships and be proactive and connect as a classroom community and know how to be a member of a group is so important for our 8, 9, and 10 year olds and um, they, they spend the majority of their day with their class together and so building that community um, is essential for them. Um, creating this time in that busy academic schedule is a challenge and is strategic, but pays off dividends for sure. And Wentworth is fortunate to have two social workers and two school counselors serving our nearly 700 kiddos. So four student advocates, um, they work very hard and they do an excellent job. The advocates use pieces of the um, social thinking curriculum. Um, we still have Superflex at Wentworth. It's still very appropriate and um, one of my favorite unthinkables is Glassman and um, he also has very big reactions to small problems. So the, the students still relate to that and can build upon it. Um, at Wentworth and they also use the zones of regulation which is an adaptation of the social thinking curriculum and kind of how your body is running. Am I running on red? I'm really too energetic. I need to get some of this energy out or am I on green? Ready to learn. Um, so and, and what adjustments can I make? So that, that work generally happens in small groups and individually. We also have our school counselors who do developmental guidance lessons for every classroom at Wentworth School. Um, that's taught to the whole class by the two school counselors. And they are um, taught interpersonal and intrapersonal skills starting right at the doorway. They shake hands, have a formal greeting, learn how to use polite manners, enter the classroom. So just these small important skills. And um, the curriculum, the curriculum I, I could spend another hour telling you all the really important diverse components of this guidance curriculum at the phase level, but a few highlights are um, how to make friends, how to show interest, how to be inclusive, how to listen well, how powerful words are, um, diversity education, um, what a reputation is, how do people know us, all of these all of these skills are taught in a very supportive way. Um, Mrs. Kuchenberger recently observed one of our school counselors and she's talked to me about it no less than five times, I think, because there's so much packed into that, that um, really important work. Um, also, in terms of the work that we do, there's some student-led work that happens. Um, we have service clubs like the K-Kids and the Civil Rights Team and even our Spirit Committee at Wentworth School is all about school culture and being inclusive and how to um, make Wentworth a really wonderful place to learn and grow. So even with all of that, um, sometimes unexpected behavior does happen because these kiddos are 8, 9, and 10 years old. So in the same way that expected behavior is really clearly communicated and defined, we do the same thing with unexpected behavior. It's clearly communicated. It is defined. There are different levels of unexpected behavior, um, yellow level, orange level, and red level, and different um, responses for each level. So yellow level behavior is an example might be um, cutting in line and that may require a reminder and a redirection um, up to red level behavior which um, are more significant and for any student 
um, who demonstrates red level behavior, we have more intense support for them. Just like what was discussed at K2, it's about an opportunity to learn and grow and make a different decision next time when in the same set of circumstances. So. Um, what we have at Wentworth School, we provide high levels of support and they engage in a series of three lunch meetings with one of our student advocates. Um, it's called Respect Academy. Sounds very exciting, right? <laughs> so Respect Academy in its um, direct, direct support and um, they really focus on the choice. They focus on what can be redirected into a more expected um, choice the next time, and then the restoration. Again, and I know Mr. Courier will talk a little bit more about that. Um, that restoration at third through fifth grade can look anything like um, a facilitated apology or a face-to-face -face conversation, um, bringing two students together. Actually, the students do a really great job um, generating the best responses. Like oh man, yeah, what am I going to do to fix this? You know, I think that he wants to learn how to play Foursquare. I wasn't really that kind, so next week I'm going to set a goal to teach this student how to play Foursquare. And then our student advocate will check back in with them, and so um, those are some of the ways that really su we support that. Um, Respect Academy is just another opportunity to build closer relationships with caring adults, um, help students discover their strengths within and tools and strategies, to enhance them, um, and we engage the families as partners. Communication is really important, um, and keeping those lines open uh, is a priority for us. And so finally, to kind of stay on top of the, whole, the pulse of the whole school and what's going on, the student advocates team, so that's the four school, the two social workers, two school counselors, our nurses, and the school leaders um, meet weekly and just talk about, okay, what things are cropping up? Do we need to do some more support in these classrooms? If something comes up with, um, you know, something online that comes into school, will involve the DARE officer from the middle school or one of our DARE officers to come help and support the students through that and really just be proactive. Um, with the things that our students are facing. It's hard to be 8, 9, and 10 today. And it's hard to um, be in a, in a large school and making these decisions all day long. So I think overall, not overall, with my whole heart, we have amazing students. Um, and they work really hard to um, be successful. And it's really a joy to support them in that. So I believe Mr. Courier is next from the middle school. Mr. Courier. Assistant principal at the middle school, and I'll do his introduction for him so that he doesn't forget it when he comes up here. <laughs> Thank you, in case I forgot my introduction. Uh, at the middle school, uh, it's so nice to see common threads that are, are intertwined through K2, through Wentworth, to the middle school. And, and the, a lot of the, the common terms that we'll be using will, will be words that you've already heard before. Uh, for us, a, a positive climate and culture in our building is imperative. And, and in order to have a student learn appropriately, they need to feel safe in the school. So with that in mind, that uh, some of the things – oh, I got the introduction but didn't get the flip forward. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Kuchenberger. So with middle school, this is no, by no means an exhaustive list of, of all of the things that we do, just some of the highlights with creating that positive school climate. As you can see from, uh, from this slide, we had a school-wide assembly with Michael Chase from the Kindness Center and talked to our students about how important it was to be kind. And we, we will do things throughout the course of the day to uh, reinforce that throughout the course of the year to reinforce how important the kindness is. We've had Mark Brown, who is a speaker uh, who speaks internationally on bullying, came to our school. And actually, when I say came to our school, because of our size, we were actually at Wentworth for our presentations because we cannot house all of our students together in our building. So uh, thank you to Wentworth for housing us uh, for our school-wide assemblies. We also have uh, enlisted the help of George Conant who is a former administrator and uh, works with the Restorative Project of Maine. 
and he has come into our school for staff development. And his, uh, his uh, work with our school has been ongoing throughout the course of the year. He has given us a direction and has tailored a direction to the needs of our school, uh, specifically to the needs of our students. Within that support, we also have our student advocacy staff. And again, you can see common threads that have gone through each of the schools. Our health, clear, uh, our health staff is very important. Our nurses, our medical assistant works with uh, such a, a wonderful member uh, members of our team with the administration, with the student advocacy to make sure, again, going back to the initial comments about the whole child, we feel that, that working with the whole child is such an important piece to seeing growth, emotional growth, physical growth. Some of the supports that will be in place next year, we'll be rolling out a crew program, and the crew program is going to work with smaller groups with a, uh, a crew member, an advisor, working with small groups of students. And it will be working with circles. It will be working with uh, emotional support, uh, academic support. So many components that are going to be rolled out with this program. In addition to our support, uh, our school resource officer is instrumental in educating our students and our families. He is uh, a vital part in our, uh, our whole process of the restorative practices. And we'll be talking about the restorative practices in the next slide. And with that, uh, I'd like to mention, of course, the administrators, the staff, is, is uh, all working together. We're all working together to uh, create a healthy environment. Additional pieces that we've put in, and, and if you look at the logos, we, we have the Boys to Men, who all of our eighth grade boys were involved with this year. Uh, we have had Healthy Girls, uh, I'm sorry, Hardy Girls and Healthy Women programs that have come in for our eighth grade girls, and both have uh, shown excellent success that our, our teachers are able to refer back to the training that the students had, and that will be something that will be ongoing, and there will be a threat of that as they continue on to the high school as well. In October, we hosted a Unity Day where different programs were, uh, were introduced throughout the school to work against bullying for, again, kindness, acceptance, tolerance. All of those, people, all of those pieces are, are absolutely vital to the health of our school. We have heard the term restorative practices a few times tonight. And in the bullet piece, uh, one of the things that I did mention was talking the common language. And that common language is consistent through our schools. And for restorative practices, for people who are not familiar with that, a, a brief description of that would be a focus on building, maintaining, and when, ne when necessary, repairing relationships among members of the school community developing a culture of caring and respect through empathy, trust, accountability, and repairing harm and collaboration. So those are all very important terms in repairing harm at, at any level, whether it's a, a simple disagreement in class or whether it comes to something that is uh, going towards the lines of, of being physical. Having that repair is so important because those feelings when someone is harmed do not just go away. We as a school need to do a much better job of educating on choices and educating on an appropriate way to handle uh, different situations. When situations do arise, we have a reflection form that we use throughout our school. And that reflection form asks the student to be honest. What happened? What were you doing at the time? What do you need to do to make things right? And students I have found by working uh, working with the different staff members are very honest and very open. This is what happened. This is how I was feeling, and this is what I need to do to make things right. So we go through a, a plan that is somewhat outlined by the student, but also outlined by the staff of how to repair that harm. One of the, the pieces that we look at this, and, and uh, looking over the last couple of years, when, when we strongly believe that there needs to be a measurable piece of, of the restorative practice, we go back to look and see if any of these incidents, incidences have reoccurred. And very seldom do we have any conflict that stems from something that we have dealt with. And so we revisit students and we tell them that they've made some good choices since then, that we're hearing that everything is, uh, has been improved 
And for them, that, that touch back a little bit of saying, I'm hearing that things are going well, is so important in continuing that education piece. Not that, all right, I was dealt with and everybody's forgotten about it, but let the students know that we are still concerned and we are still talking and making sure that one student is safe, but the, the behavior has not, uh, has not happened again. So we have heard the term community circles throughout the, the uh, other schools, and that's something that we will work on and continue to work on in our school because that level of communication between the staff and the students really builds a level of trust. And I've gone into a, a few of uh, circles that we have on our day C on our rotation, and it's been very valuable for me so that when I talk with a student, I can bring something else in, something from their circle. And it, it, it helps me when I work with a student that I don't necessarily need to go to the reason that I'm meeting with them, but we can talk about a circle, something that they, they had discussed in class. So making the relationships between the staff with Barbara and I included is very important, but also creating that relationship student to student because in a circle, a student might find that someone else has a passion that they have and that they, wow, unless we had a circle, I never would have known that that person has the same interest that I do. So the circle piece is, is very important for building relationships and goes through to the, pact of the part of the restorative piece as well. We do have restorative meetings that I mentioned a little bit before. Those restorative meetings might be within a class. They might be one-on-one. -on -one. And I've even had restorative meetings with parents. And the parents are a key part of this, that they understand that, that we're not in a school to just punish. We're here to educate, even when things go wrong, to educate. And the, the support that we have received from our parents has really been overwhelming because they want that, their child to learn from this experience. And we're facilitating that, that growth, that learning. Additionally, we have a PBIS program at the middle school where students who have had challenges behaviorally do earn an incentive. And I mentioned in a previous slide, our SRO, one of the, the uh, pieces that our students absolutely love when they have achieved a goal is to go and play basketball with Officer Pellerin. That is one of the highlights that they talk about over and over. And so that for them is a great incentive and that is just one of the, the many incentives that, that students uh, work towards in our school. But again, going back to the whole student and being able to educate the whole student and every instance that we deal with needs to be an educational experience. Any questions that you may have? Actually, I did have one question that came up after the um, rising sixth grade parent meeting that we had. Um, somebody asked me how crews will meet when there's such a space crunch at the middle school, if there aren't even, you know, if they're going to be smaller groups than a homeroom. How's that all going to work? And where are you going to put people? <laughs> That's something that with the rollout piece that we're, we're still working on, the logistics, yeah. but uh, in our school space is very limited. Right. Even when we've talked about the, uh, the restorative piece, having a place to, to work on that restorative right. part is very limited at the middle school. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Oh, so they will be used in science labs, all right. of the encore classes. That's what I figured. Every little nook and cranny. That's what I figured. Yeah, that's what I that's what I told the parent. But I was just wanted to point out that it's going to be tight. <laughs> it is, and that is something that we understand, and, and we are working to make sure that every student knows their place and every staff has a yeah. place to meet with their student. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, as we're transitioning, I would just add that I think that that really says a lot about the leadership and the staff at the middle school, that it'd be really easy to say, like, oh, you know, that's a great idea, but we just don't have the space and, right. and not do it. Um, but instead, they're really trying to think outside of the box and be creative about how they do use their space, even though it is challenging in every aspect of the programming and the work that they do. Um, and I, I think that that can't be um, under-celebrated and, and talked about. Mm -hmm. 
Kelly, what, what was the program? I missed the. So what was the program that you're speaking of then? Crew. It's I don't know what that is. Like the advisory period oh, at the high school, similar. So smaller oh. groups than just the so whole So they're going rest. to be doing that at the middle school. Yes, yeah, for next year. For all, for six, seven, and eight. Gotcha. Okay. Hi, I'm David Creech. I'm the principal of high school. <laughs> 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 you know, as I'm listening to the, each of the phase levels, uh, share absolutely wonderful programs that they have in place. Uh, it absolutely supports one of the first things that I wanted to share, which is uh, we are truly blessed at Scarborough High School and throughout the district with absolutely fabulous students. Um, that doesn't happen by accident. The, it, the combination of family values and the support and the strength of what the family brings uh, to, in terms of their expectations and support for their children, combined with what's happening at K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, listening to um, all three of them mention the different types of things that are being taught in terms of respect and some of those little things that a lot of times people take for granted. And I, I can tell you from the first week I went to work at Scarborough High School to right now, I'm always amazed and share a few things about our students. One. Step into the cafeteria at Scarborough High School with 350 to 400 students eating lunch and watch that and compare that to other high schools. And you're going to be amazed at how they get along. Of course, there are things at times at the high school level that are a challenge, but watch them in the hallways when they interact. Go to the school during class and see if you can find a student in the hallway. They're in class. They're engaged. And I think we have fabulous students. I remember. Sue Ketch can attest to this. Each year she has a wonderful program. She talks to new teachers, and each year I've come in and the first week kind of introduce myself and ask how things are going. And I think every year new teachers will say, I, I can't believe it when the students get up to leave my class. They're all thanking me. And, you know, and, and the level of respect and politeness is, as I mentioned earlier, it's unique. There aren't a whole lot of high schools that I've been in or know of that have students like ours. And, again, I don't think it's by accident. And so... Everything that's been taught and reinforced from K all the way up to high school and the combination of the support and the values of the families, I think, are key to this. If you go to any of our presentations, some of you have been there when we've had our eighth grade parent information night, you'll hear me speak initially about what I think is one of the most important things that we have in place in high school, and that's our network of support. There's no doubt in my mind, uh, in my experience as an educator, that the rapport and relationships that are built with students is at the heart of when, if, whether students feel safe at school, supported, uh, their level of confidence and success, I think, are tied directly to that. So part of what I've mentioned here is this network of support. We have what we call a building support team. So we're blessed with individuals that it doesn't matter what the nature of, it, of the incident, the issue, the need, whether it's in school, out of school, my leadership team, which includes Greg, Sue, Mike, Catherine, our resource officer, uh, Frank Plord, the two building ed techs, um, Tim and David, they're all over the building all the time, connecting with students, building good relationships, making sure that things are safe, people are where they're supposed to be. Our two nurses, our secretaries, who you all know are at the heart of any school and the relationships they build, that's our building support team. They're constantly working to support our students, our staff, and our families. And then we have the rest of the school community that you would be our advisors from our advisee program, our coaches, uh, school counselors, uh, parents' involvement. Our parents are extremely involved and very supportive. Our social workers and staff that aren't teaching staff would be our ed techs, cafeteria workers, custodians, bus drivers, um, and our teachers. They're all a part of this network of support. And I know it might sound like I'm just listing off the people that work there, but those are the people that have direct contact with our students on a regular basis, and they know when, what the needs are and what necessarily has to happen to build that rapport with that student so they can be successful and connect with them, like um, we have heard at the other phase levels. And then I'm really proud, especially in the last three years, of the level of support and growth in our student groups. So you see a few of those listed there, and, and I know we've mentioned before, Lizzie's a part of a group that that I did not put up there, but I call that one of those student outreach groups where we have students that are taking the initiative to be a part of supporting other students. So we have our buddy system. Um, 
which Amy developed, which is we have uh, regular education students that meet with special needs students to go to events and connect with them and spend time with them outside the school day. Um, our civil rights team, our Gender and Sexuality Alliance, Natural Helpers, they're all working to support the needs of our diverse population. Reverse mainstreaming is similar to what happens with the buddy system where we have regular education students meeting and working with special needs students and, and we all know the benefits to those relationships. Um, and we've had recently, as Dave mentioned, we have our main boys to men program that's new this year. Um, that program involved RSVP training where almost 40 students were trained and we didn't train them just to be trained as a part of the main boys to men program. We wanted to have student leaders who were going to be tackling some of those tough issues that students go through and be a part of planning how do we support students and how can we use our advisory program best and what are the actual needs that need to be addressed. So I'm proud of all of that network of support, but probably most proud of the student groups and their willingness to stand up and be leaders and tackle the hardest issues. And I think every phase level I know has challenges, but I think it's the toughest time ever to be a teenager. What our teenagers have to face is so much more challenging than I think than a lot of us had to face. So the network of support for us is, is key to what we put in place regardless of the programs or services that we, that we offer. So what are some of the programs and supports specifically that help us with dealing with uh, some of the issues you heard discussed at other phase levels? And I think our advisory program is something that we've started this year that's going to be instrumental. So remember, our advisory program, you'll have students, ninth grade through 12th grade with the same 10, 11, 12 students and the same advisor. So they're building a great relationship with another caring adult who can support them through high school. During that time, they have the opportunity not only to connect with other students, but we have programs and trainings and things that we can offer during the advisory time that can be a building-based activity and then brought back to the advisory program for small group discussion so they can really break it down and have some of those uh, types of conversations that typically students can't have unless they're in a group with other students and an adult that they trust and they've built a relationship with. So we think our advisory program is going to be instrumental. Um, we, as you know, we have a strong alternative education program for students who a regular school day and what we offer, it, it doesn't meet their needs. And their program is fantastic. It's a, a program designed to meet the needs of each and every one of those students, and we see them thriving. The RSVP training was what I was referencing that was done by our main boys to, to men program. And not only have we had training for those nearly 40 students, that group of students has done a school-wide training for our staff to raise awareness of the supports they have to put in place for students, and they've done something specifically recently for seniors because we wanted to equip seniors with some skills and some strategies as they leave high school and go on to life after high school, whether it's college or career, that will prepare them for some of the challenges they've met. And again, that's that group of students and their advisors that have led that. And of course, special education staff, our special education staff is second to none. It's amazing the level of support they have for each and every student and the services. And then our student services department, that's our school counselors, our social workers. Um, and I think most of you know that they try to be proactive as opposed to reactive. They're always in classrooms. They have, they have group meetings to deal with students who struggle with social skills. Um, and they're always trying to get into the classroom with a high school-based curriculum, similar to what you heard from some of the other schools. So. We have, we, and there are many more programs and supports in place, but I just wanted to highlight a few of those that I think are key factors to success at the high school level for supports for our students. And I believe Kelly referenced it as uh, unwanted student behavior, but I didn't want to, unexpected. unexpected student behavior. I was going to say expected student behavior, but I didn't think that would be politically correct. So. I just want to talk a little bit about what I think um, 
we never have an opportunity to share at the high school level, and, and that is the process we have to address any type of student behavior. First of all, every single issue or any type of student behavior, each and every one of those is treated as a unique set of circumstances. I have, I've, I think we are blessed with tremendous leadership in how this is carried out. It is always a very thorough investigation. We, we based what, what we have to do on facts. We include everybody that needs to be included in that process. Um, and it's always a very transparent, um, dignified process where the students are put at the center of what we do. There's a strong communication place to that. So whatever we're having to do, we try to pull in our parents and social workers or counselors or whoever is needed, perhaps a case manager, to support the unique set of circumstances behind that behavior. And then we create a plan. And yes, we have guidelines for behavior. And there are consequences. Um, some of the behaviors in the high school might be a little bit different than other phase levels. But the consequences themselves are a very small part of the, pro of the plan. The major part of that plan is that team of individuals that were at the heart of figuring out what's going on and why it happened, they have to be a part of what's most important to us is, yeah, there are going to be consequences for actions, but what are we doing to address why those things happened? How can we support that student? Why did that student, you heard David and Kelly mention this, why are those behaviors the behaviors they did? What is at the core for what happened? How can we support them? Um, and oftentimes when I've had a conversation with a student that for whatever reason it's come to me in the process, I've always, when we've talked about the follow through and the support we're going to in place, I said, you're going to spend more time with me now than you ever did before because I'm going to go out of my way when I see you to touch base with you and how are you doing. Because we have a thousand students and it's hard to connect with all of them. But that's one thing we pride ourselves in is that students know that this is just not addressing a specific behavior and having consequences. There's follow through and support. And parents and families and the students are all a part of that plan. And if it's not working, we adjust. And we put into place what will help support that student. And that's the monitor and support piece. So I would also say what I think would be a very accurate statement, that I have never been in a high school or know of a high school that deals with less disciplinary or behavior issues than Scarborough High School. I mean, we, we have adolescents that at times student behavior is a challenge. But for the most part, um, we don't have to face what a lot of high schools have to face on a regular daily basis at a much higher level than we do. And I think that the rationale or the reason for that is what I discussed at the very beginning of this. It's the K through 12 approach. It's the support of the families. It's some of those skills that have been taught to them at a younger level. And it's also the supports and programs we have in place for students at the high school level. So I'll finish with what I started with. Uh, in 32 years, I have never been fortunate enough to be around students like the students at Scarborough High School. We were truly blessed. I pinch myself every day, and I know it didn't happen by accident. It's a combination, plat uh, combination platter of that whole, it takes a village to raise a child. Floating in the air, so apologies for all the coughing that's gone on in this meeting. Um, any comments in general about the presentation? Anyone? I, I would just add that um, this, the work that our school leadership is doing at each phase level, when I think about um, and participate in regional meetings around like prevention and opioid crisis and what schools are doing, what curriculums are in place, what resources are they accessing, what resources do you need? I really, when I think about that work, I think every one of these components that our, our principals and our assistant principals are putting in place for our students is prevention. Um, I think the way that we're teaching them to, help, to, to learn how to regulate their emotions at a very young age and have, to have language to describe and support um, those feelings that they're having and being able to really know that there's trusted adults in their school community that they can go to, like all of that to me is, um, is prevention and, and does help us 
help our students really navigate some really challenging social issues. And I mean, I'm sure our students could tell you how complex it is to, to navigate their day-to-day -day, um, life as a high school student, but it's, it's just as challenging for our K-2 students and all of our students in between. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to think next about how do we really engage parents and share with them some of the strategies and the techniques that, that we're using um, in the school in a really successful way so that they can also be applying that at home. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And thank you to our principals for preparing and presenting tonight. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Very informative and it's, you know, you hear bits and pieces and especially where our own kids are, where they are falling in the K-12 spectrum, you know what's going on in that school, but it's nice to see uh, the, the array from start to start to finish about all the supports that are in place and good leadership and um, um, important that we have those supports and that we've been able to provide the staff that can do that. I know the behavioral specialist was a, was a budget item last year or this year and maybe two years ago with one. Um, but an asset that is that can spread to all staff members, you know, giving tips and guidance and the training that has happened, um, you know, just specifically I know about the suicide policy that is in place currently requires everyone that is employed in the schools to be trained and to recognize signs and um, I just think that's important, that it's not always going to be a teacher that's going to see the signs or that a student feels comfortable talking to, but it might be somebody that gives them lunch every day or they're riding on the bus with. Or, um, so we have, uh, we're very fortunate. We have a great staff and a lot of important programs in place that we've been able to um, cross-educate people with. So thank you to everybody for coming tonight and for sharing that information. Anybody else, anything? Are we ready? No, Jackie. I would just like to, to say a, a word about the play. <laughs> I think, really, I, I was blown away by the performance. These young people just laid it all out. <laughs> and I didn't realize what absolutely fabulous voices we had at our high school. So many of them. And I understand from Mr. Sizemore that on Saturday evening, uh, the, the youngsters presented a poster from Mrs. K Ms. Ketch's uh, direction of Greece. And I understand that this performance was a close performance to what her students produced. <laughs> but I also took, you know, they were sending, uh, selling uh, tickets for this playbill which is from the original production of Greece in New York and I won it <laughs> so I'd like to catch to have it <laughs> you're very welcome <laughs> thank you and I agree. Everyone that saw it knows that it was fantastic, and Susie and Thomas, fantastic job. Well, the audience was also fantastic. I'd just like to acknowledge that. Yeah. Every single night, it was very responsive, very, very good, and they filled in the seats, too. Yeah, yeah that's great. We've been right down the house every yeah. night. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Saturday evening, they actually overfilled the auditorium. Had to bring in the weather was conducive to seeing a play that yeah. <laughs> yeah, <so laughs> was great. <laughs> also, this is Thomas's first time back from the academic decathlon, yeah. right? Amazing job. Yeah. Amazing right. job. Do you want to give us a little rundown on that? Um, oh, are we saving it? Yeah, I was about to say um, <laughs> next week. That's a cliffhanger. Probably most importantly, what just happened last this week? Oh, yeah. Um, I got my driver's license. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> First time. Fantastic. Fantastic. Right. Congratulations, yeah. Thomas. Thank you. It's an excellent meeting, by the way. Thank you all. <laughs> Do we have a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you.